All right. It's amateur hour, everyone. Hello, <laughs> Th anyone that's joining us, thank you for joining us. Uh, you're stuck with the rank amateurs this week. Uh, and Nicole is on a well-deserved vacation. Um, so he sent me a to-do list as to how to make all this work. And um, hopefully it's idiot proof enough so that I don't screw this up royally. So uh, Alan, Celtic by numbers, nice to see you. Yep, yep. See how we get on without adult supervision. <laughs> yeah, I, I we usually have some small talk uh, with Enda corralling the cats before we go live, so we haven't had a chance to do that because I've been paranoid about getting everything up and running. So, so how you been? Oh, you were up up north uh, last week, I think, right? Next week, actually. Oh, yeah. it's next week. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully we'll still be able to catch up, but uh, yeah, we'll be visiting. Uh, visiting relatives who have not seen since October 2019. So looking forward to it. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's great. I'm sure it's wonderful. It's been the same for us getting to see, um, particularly my wife's side of the family that lives about four hours away. Um, right. Been catching up with them recently. So it's, it's good for the soul, good for what ails us. Um, well, good. So I just wanted to start by um, reviewing the games last week. So we had the Jablonic 4-2 victory it seems like an eternity ago with the new cycles, the way they've been going uh, a week ago today. And then obviously the um, the party atmosphere and the fun of Sunday, the 6-0 over, over Dundee back at Celtic Park. Um, so I, I think, you know, given we're a week out and what, four days past the Dundee, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on these two games. I think we have some uh, higher time frame uh, macro topics to discuss Um so what, just your general thoughts, takeaways from the two games other than the, the two rock stars that we'll discuss. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, great to see Joy Joy back in, in the game and in the performances, uh, obviously. Um, and, you know, as I keep saying to you, uh, James, a week's a long time in football and things can change uh, very quickly. And in the context of Scottish football, things have changed a lot this week uh, across the board. So... Um, you know, let's see where we are at the end of August, but I suspect we may have seen a significant uh, shift. Let's hope so, anyway. But um, the performances, what I mean, what I'm looking for again, it always is about the performances. I know the results, I want we all want to win, right? But the performances are more of an indicator of how we're going to do going forward, and and you know, we're, we're gradually improving and gradually getting more potent and from an attacking perspective, the ideas around what um, Postacog was trying to achieve in terms of where he's wanting, uh, how he's wanting the forwards to play, where he's want, how, how he wants the ball delivered into the box, for example, and from, and from which positions, um, how he's wanting you know, the interactions to create overloads in certain parts of the field. All of those things are starting to improve. We've got a long way to go, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I sat here thinking about the Dundee game and, you know, I see my job in life is 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 if you know to do an, an assessment of the Dundee game is to come up with a list of five things that you know what could we do better because that's that's how we're going to improve is to sort of say you know what 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 do we take out of that? There was so many positives and we'll come to a couple of those, but there's clearly things still to work on. You know, I, I think there was a couple of interesting um, insights into expected goals models across the two games, as far as yeah, opposition right. chances are concerned. Uh, for example, yeah. in the Jablonek game, I think their expected goals was massively inflated by the fact that I think a couple of crosses were interpreted as shots and therefore inflated their uh, expected goals. And then against Dundee, uh, a lot of the XG models seem to have missed a couple of um, shots from inside the six-yard box. Sheridan poked one just past the post from a, a flicked-on header. It was a, it wasn't an easy chance, but it was within the right. six-yard box from a set piece. And so I had Dundee's expected goal near one, which is probably you know three or four times more than a lot of XG models. So there was a lot of things still there that were still you know work in progress, right? And and that's you know I'm trying not to get too excited. I loved the attacking play. I loved some of the individual performances. What I'm trying to do here is just sort of say, look, you've still got a long way to go. You know, some of the the, the hearts passing. I think he's he's playing it very safe. You know, and and that's great. And he's not giving the ball away like he did a lot in Jablonek, but it means that the, sometimes you'll lack momentum in getting the ball forward. Um, you know, Starfell is still um, looking a little bit uh, cumbersome. I think it's just his gait and his manner. And again, his passing's very safe, and that's fine. And he's not giving the ball away. 
And I think he's probably, um, it's difficult for him being surrounded by a system that is less than ideal and personnel yep. that are less than ideal. Um, so for me, uh, and, and also, you know, in terms of attacking um, depth, clearly, I mean, I put out a tweet yesterday, really, if you take out the the ones that are not are really not considered first team players, we're we're at, we're at sort of a twenty one person squad. If you assume that certain players like Bolongoli, Edward are, are going to be right. are going to be leaving, so lots and lots to go at. And that's why I say I think at the end of August it'll be a lot clearer the prospects for this season uh, across the board. But so one of the questions I had uh, kind of built up to ask you because I'm really curious is your. Um, what, what, what's your view on the relative um, playing style of Edouard versus uh, Kyogo, particularly in, in the Sunday game, obviously, where he went berserk in a fun way? And, and I think that's one thing to highlight. I mean, it's, it's good just to have fun watching um, Celtic again. It's been a rough uh, 12 months. Um, so that, that that relief, you know, above and beyond the analytical side of it, it was just uh, yeah, incredible. It was fun. incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible to have fun watching again. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I, I you know, again, I, I don't um, pretend to have anywhere near the level of uh, expertise that you do in in kind of analyzing the actual um, intricacies of of movement off the ball, that type of thing. So one of the things I'd heard about, and certainly it seems like it produced output. Uh, with Kyoko is his off the ball movement, and it, it just seemed intuitively that he would be a better fit than a, and an Edward for the uh, you know we're going to talk about this in the next next segment kind of the evolution of Ange Ball already. Um, so maybe just a little bit on what you think that that disparity is between those two players, not not better or worse, just what they do differently hmm. that that's really been highlighted um, in a game like Sunday where yeah. where. Kyogo was so uh, dominant. Sure. I mean, I, I can't think of many strikers in recent times that are like him in terms of physique, stature, style of play. Um, but his, he's, he's absolutely rapid. <laughs> uh, I mean, the goal, the goal against Jablonek, the touch, which in, for any other striker wouldn't have been a good touch because actually it went quite far in front of him. But he is so quick. He got to the ball just before the goalkeeper and effortlessly flicked it into the corner. It was a absolute wow moment for me. I mean, like a genuine sort of, did I just see that correctly? I had to watch it back. Right. I had to watch back two of his goals from the weekend because I didn't, I couldn't see in real time how he'd actually connected. Because because he he'd reacted that quickly. Now you know, and I'm getting you know, I'm getting old, so I'm not seeing things as quickly as I used to. But, <laughs> but, um, but that that absolute sheer blistering pace. You would ask any defender, it is the worst thing. It's the thing they fear. You know, put a big gnarly six foot five centre back up against even a, even a Chris Sutton type player, and you're gonna you're gonna get a hard battle, and it's gonna be really tough. But you kind of know where you are. You're in you're in the realms of comfort in terms of. You're going to have to fight, battle, head the ball, scratch, elbow. Put somebody uh, like that up against a guy like Kyogo, and you're you're in you're way out your comfort zone because he moves so quickly. Um, you know, Edward's not not slow, but it's that it's that acceleration, that almost instant acceleration. He's a little guy. His center of gravity is low. He can move. He's light. He doesn't take a lot of. It doesn't take a lot of coal to get the engine moving. You know what I mean? Edward's right. a big. Edward's a bigger guy, right? So, the, so, there's, so I think there's a difference there. You know, Edward's starting position. If you look at any heat map, you know better than me. You have access to all these heat maps. Like I don't have the means to produce them from my data. I'd love to. Um, right. You know, there's, there's, there's that little zone, isn't there? Just, just sort of on the left hand side of the box and just outside. That's the kind of Edward zone. It's where he's comfortable picking the ball up. He can make runs. He can take shots from reasonable distance. He can slip balls through because he's more of a, I would say he's a hybrid between a nine and a 10 in that, in that regard. Um, I think the two of them could fight <laughs> together. would be very interesting, but it, it doesn't seem that Ange plays too up front. So, um, and then, and then there's a work off the ball. Again, if you look at, I think I, I pointed out uh, in on Twitter that, if you look at a typical Edward defensive action performance, and this is no criticism of him, this is probably typical of 90% of forwards, frankly, is you know he might win one to two duels in a game and he'll lose nine or ten. Okay, 
Um, with Kyogo, he won five duels uh, on the weekend. He didn't lose any. Right. <laughs> so, so he wasn't. He just wasn't engaging. He just didn't. He, he, he's not going to engage in a high ball punted forward. And actually, that, that because it didn't happen because Celtic were so smart, they never actually bothered to pass to him. Edward would probably be involved in the game almost twice as many uh, touches and involvements than in Kyogo because he drops deep. He comes into different pockets. Kyogo is all about in the box. He, 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 every single shot he took was in, in, in the box and, and, and from a pretty much a central position. He hardly, right. he, 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 he took, he, he completed 10 passes. He touched the ball nine times in the box. He's, I mean, this is like, that's, that's Pete Griffiths, actually. If you go back to Pete Griffiths when Griffiths was scoring 40 goals, that was the kind of thing that you got. You got very little involvement outside the box at all. Um, but this is a fascinating player and he's got some incredible attributes. So, so excited to see uh to see i'm trying not to over overstate anything here but very excited to see how this goes yeah i, I agree i mean it, it, we talked about it upon his signing and the initial things that i looked at um you know obviously not being terribly um or even uh at all informed about the j league yeah. at the time yeah. um it really does i mean it, it's you know amongst the data geek community um the j league is by far the cheapest league i mean that the value that you can get and the idea that we paid less for him than what we paid for a jetty at the same time last year is wild hmm. i mean and that's not to put down a jetty um but i mean it's just wild and i the guy that uh mccora i think is his name he was actually the one when i first looked at the j league um uh uh, and I, again, it gets Casala, the names, you, I always say me in languages, forget it, but uh, Fr Fronte, I think is the fr one in the name, but he, he's going to Brighton. And I think they paid 3 million for him. Right. And it's like insane. I mean, this guy was, I, I'm guessing he's probably in the neighborhood of Kyoko as far as quality. And that was the one that I jumped out. I was like, you know, hopefully Ange sees it, you know, knows this guy obviously, and he's the type that we're going to sign. So, um, yeah, it looks like a fertile market, and hopefully, it's something that we're going to continue to look at and mine, so to speak, for talent. Because, yeah, boy, if we can get somebody like him for four and a half, I mean, wow. I'm almost I'm surprised that we haven't don't seem to have been uh, linked with any of the other players from that league. I thought he would have a shopping list. Yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I, I already I, already you know <laughs> ready to yeah, go. Yeah, I, I joked this week. I mean, just uh, reform our recruitment policy. Just get Ange to get four or five. I mean, let's get the uh, yeah. majority. Let's get the majority shareholders private plane to Japan and just get a shipment in. He's, uh, I was expecting uh, Buster Cogley uh, to turn up with the little the little basket icon full and just handing over to uh, to, right. to Mackay saying baskets full. Just press check. Yeah. Out. We're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. that's, um, you know, the, the Japanese national team. And, and that's really been my um, exposure to Japanese football over the years, both on, and, you know, with being an American um, with, with our ladies team or women's team. So, so good, uh, excluding the recent Olympics um, was, you know, the, the Japanese players all so intelligent and technical um and and so good with movement and, and we saw that with with kyoko so far so i i and with ange ball being the way it is and we're going to segue in that in, in a little bit i mean it just seems like a, a tailor-made fit um from a profile perspective to maybe scrape off some more of that elite talent out of that league but um so l let's talk about ryan christie a little bit because he's he's a hot topic whether or not he's uh, going to be leaving um the weird nature of his contract reportedly through December um, instead of through a full season. You and I have speculated in, in, month, in the recent weeks or a couple months as far as um, how uh, how well fit he was from a profile perspective with, with Ange Ball, so to speak. Um, I think he's uh, certainly proved that so far. Uh, so w w why do you think he's been playing so well and, and how does he fit in so well with, with the system so far? Yeah, no, I, I mean, why? Because he's a he's a really good player. <laughs> um, you know, I think he got picked out last season for probably lots. You know, each individual will have their cognitive biases as to why they thought Christie was worthy of being picked on over or beyond anyone else. I don't think his numbers went down any more or less than anyone else's 
and he still contributed a lot uh really so across you know and he's one of these he's one of these rare players that you know if you look if you look at my spreadsheet for capturing data I mentioned this before and there's all these columns and you know your defenders fill those ones and your attackers fill those ones christie fills all of them you know right. he's, he's, there's action across every sort of conceivable um you know action type event if you want to put it that way uh so he brings that really he brings an energy he brings a speed of thought he brings a purposefulness to play uh really and and, and listen he's been playing left wing and i'm not aware that he's played many games of any at left wing before so there's that you had you know against dundee he played most of the game on the left wing and then he when rogic went off he went in as an eight and he and he just produced another you know two two great performances in one so right right side of eight too right I yeah, mean, he was in yeah. the right half space yeah yeah, yeah. He, he he created 10 chances in the game which is just ridiculous considering i think he did take i think he did maybe create one from a corner he took a corner and i think it resulted in a chance but but yeah. generally wasn't all right from free kicks so 10 chances you know three assists two of them are which is beautiful <laughs> you talk about putting the fun back in the game i mean two of my favorite types of pass in football one was the the slide the from sliding ball across the six yard box that the keeper just cannot quite get right and then and then the the inside pass to kyogo for his hat trick i just is my favorite my favorite pass of in football it's just a beauty yeah yeah and it, and it you know it was it was a gasp moment i think in the crowd that were there when, when they saw that and then of course you've got the speed of of Kyogo um, to get on the end of it, which just makes it look even better, <laughs> you know, because you, you'll make any ball look decent because you'll 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 you'll, you'll, you'll probably get there with his speed. So, yeah, Christie was fantastic. And then on top of that, you know, it was just a sheer volume of involvement. Him and Turnbull, frankly, you know, uh, fifty-six passes complete for an attacking player. That's that's an incredible output. Uh, you know, um, he didn't he didn't he didn't contribute so much in terms of challenges. Actually, I think he was a one and eight for challenges, successful challenges, and interceptions. So that side of the game, but then he wasn't really called upon to do a lot in the way of defending. So it really was all about attacking. I mean, his packing score, and again, I don't want to get too sort of um, bogged down here, but we talk about packing and number of you know forward passes that be take opponents out of the game. You've got a passer, you've got a receiver. You can you can score every event in terms of you know if you take out a defender that's three points a midfielder that's two points so all that's up to you. and your your sort of packing score if you like you know the, the the highest packing score that a Celtic player like in Cham for example would have got in a season you would be kind of 80, 80 to eighty five average packing score so Christie on Sunday uh, was one hundred and eighty eight from that one game yeah I was going to say it had to have been insane because he he he, talk, he received a bunch of those as well so he was probably yeah. relatively balanced in that that was yeah. probably almost one hundred and nine of it. Yeah, 109 of yeah. it was receiving, 73 was in passing. That's brilliant. You know, his expected scoring contribution was over two. Uh, so yeah, it was just it was just a you know I I, I thought thought it was churlish if I didn't give my boy the match to Kyogo because I actually felt like I ought to have given it to Christy, frankly. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, and yeah. you mentioned Turnbull. I thought um, superb. The, yeah, and and one of the things that I um, I hadn't even realized it. Again, I kind of. I, I try not to get too formulaic in my game reviews because I think if you do that, you you, you end up getting into uh, lazy is not the right word, but you end up missing things that may be jumping out. Uh, so I try to take a fresh look uh, each game and try to uh, you know maintain an open mind um, to, to see if I kind of pick up some signals. And one of the things just by happenstance jumped out of me was that he played left eight, left side at eight. And I just happened to check. I was like, I, you know, just off memory, that didn't. I don't remember him having played there that much. And mostly at the ten, or maybe as a right side at eight. Um, and I knew that that had been just because of what the work I had done when we signed him. That that had been his predominant position at Motherwell. Hmm. Um, so I, I found it interesting that he seemed to kind of you no. Know, let, let's also caveat all of this. As much as we've enjoyed this, I mean, Dundee are terrible. Am I crazy? <laughs> like they're all. No, like they're all. Uh, I mean, Char after ten minutes, I was looking at Charlie Adam, thinking, "You've given the ball away." I'm thinking five times. You get it. You just lump it forward. You, you, you yeah. look. You look less fit than I do. That's that's really, that's really not good. <laughs> you know, yeah, like... <laughs> uh, and, and and that's so. I, I, you know, you never want to get too churlish with this kind of thing, but. Um, you know, I, they were a specific kind of bad on Sunday. Now, how much of that was because of our press being better? 
um, you know, because of Christie and and I, I think you know again I I, I don't share uh, other than on this the Celtic way I don't really share any stats bombs data for for licensing issues uh, on on Twitter, but um, you know they have metrics for pressing and Turnbull has actually been doing better there than I thought he was going to uh, under the Ange system. So you know I don't know how much of it was because of our press was being better, Kyogo probably being a more effective in that capacity relative to Edward. So I think a, a good portion of that was imposed by Celtic, but Dundee are really bad. And uh, they, they're probably gonna play a certain style of football that will maybe prevent them from going down, but it's not gonna make them, mm. I don't think anywhere near a threat to the better teams in the league as far as dropping points for the most part. Um, so I think that's the caveat with Turnbull, you know, multiple variables here. Uh, so it could be just because of how awful they were, but it was notable to me that I think by far his best game under Ange and maybe even his best game at Celtic from a sheer output perspective and volume um, was a, at a left-sided eight. And the only other game that I was able to identify that he played that position was against St. Johnston uh, in the 4-0 and in, in kind of the dead, you know, the, the dead part of the season when everything was just kind of running out the clock. Um, where he had a goal and assist and, you know, really played well in that 4-0 win. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I, I'm not sure he's going to get much time there with the introduction of McCarthy probably at some point in the not-too-distant future or, you know, Soro probably getting some time maybe there and, you know, McGregor probably going to be the dominant left side at eight. But um, so I, I, that was at least something – yeah, no, just a little, sorry, James, just a little snippet. Uh, I've not shared this um, or on, on anything on Twitter or, or written about this yet, but I will do at some point on Turnbull. Because I look, I started looking at Turnbull because people were kind of whinging about him and whinging about sorrow. So I thought I'll start, I'll start just building up a little background. I'll start collecting some of my own data and just start creating those little profiles sort of thing. And while well, sorrow, I think, is maybe going through a little bit of a a blip in terms of his, he's a young player, right? I know he's quite experienced, as we've mentioned before, so I don't, don't want to hide behind that for him. He's, he's actually got quite a lot of games under his belt in different leagues, right? Um, but he's, he's def, his output has dropped off. But Turnbull's was interesting. So undoubtedly, his, his attacking, pure raw attacking data has dropped off. And a large part of that is because we don't, we don't even bang in corners that much anymore. It tends to be played short. So he's really not creating a lot from set plays. And, and as we said last year, he's not actually that prolific in creating from open play. So, so that's gone down a little bit. But what has actually gone up is are his defensive um, metrics, which which is really interesting, right? right? So, is that a proxy for working harder? Is that a proxy for being asked to do to play in a slightly different way? Um, you know, I didn't notice it when I was watching the games, but it is it's definitely material in terms of the increase in defensive output from Turnbull and then he played the eight position uh, when he didn't need again he didn't need to do a lot defensively he didn't he didn't hard if I didn't win a single challenge <laughs> he didn't mean because he didn't need to but um I just felt you know there was another option there and he looked really comfortable and what what the McGregor and Turnbull and Christie performances put into start relief was Rogic Rogic was I know Rogic scored a great goal uh, and a great move but if you look at Rogic's contribution, just sheer volume of contribution versus the other two, it's it's like he was playing in it on a different. It's like he was playing on the five a side pitch across right. the road. It's, it, it, it was like he wasn't there. It's right. just really bizarre, <laughs> you know. And so yeah. that that's you know, and we know that Rogic is a slow starter. When he comes back into the team, he you know, he's like a he's like a, a an old fashioned steam train. He takes him a long time to build up speed and momentum type of thing, but. And he's 28, right? But so yeah, that was that was a bit of a downside for me. I think you know, I don't. John Hartson commentary was full of praise for him, and he did score a good goal. But he he was barely involved. He completed 14 passes, you know. And you think it, McGregor 108, Turnbull 80, Christie 56. Right. You know, it, you know, Rogic, Rogic. Yeah, he did. He created two passes, created two sh um, chances, and he had obviously his his, his his shot for his goal was the only shot that he had in the game. So compared to the other three. I do, I do, I do wonder. I know Rogic is Australian and he knows Ange, but I do, I don't think he fits into the style of play. I really don't. No, I, I agree with you, um, and that, that's a good segue into our next topic. Um, but before we go to that, I this is just spontaneous uh, question that popped into my head here. 
what what what, do, what does Turnbull's um, what you call impact score, which is basically that scoring system that you do on impact on uh, pack passing? How, yeah. how has he been showing up in that? Because he's been dropping deeper. I think part of that process that you've been you talked about, he's not you know he's not having that output creatively in the, what we call XA or you know shot assist key passes or shooting as much, but uh, is his output up in that in that packing sense? Well, it's, it's, his numbers have been completely distorted by um, Sunday because he is, his packing score was 179. As okay. I mentioned, Christie's was 188. His was 179. Right. The next highest was McGregor on 97, to give you some idea. So, yeah, you know, so, uh, uh, yeah. So, it's a bit, as, uh, as far as the season's concerned, his sort of total packing score is currently at 94 <laughs> which is right, pretty but, high and going to be difficult yeah. to maintain yeah yeah that outlier yeah, yeah. sure yeah that outlier out. and, and in that number of games is going to have a huge huge yeah, impact that, that that's still even if you pull that out I'm guessing then that, that would put him more in a, a significant increase relative to last season because he yeah. wasn't dropping as deep in fairness I mean a different yeah. role so so that's I always think about um I try to think about players in the sense of total value and this comes back to you know um, my, my uh, experience with baseball analytics um, and looking at pe people, you know, players' defensive value, um, you know, their base running, running the bases in baseball is important. And then also hitting the ball, they're, they're uh, you know, in the analogy, be attacking value. So in, in football, I think where, and this segues into our next conversation here relative to McGregor's um, dominant performance in, on Sunday. How do you value, and I, this is a rhetorical question, um, you're certainly welcome to address it, but how do you place a relative value on what McGregor did on Sunday um, and how he you know, really linked up with uh, the, the back three, back four, you know, back five, really. I was saying back three, meaning Hart and two, the two center backs, um, who, who the center backs were on the ball a ton. And linking up with them to facilitate that movement forward into the eights, into the wingers, into the inverted pullbacks, um, and how just dominant he was in that role. Um, how do you value that, and how do you, how how is that valued relative? Because you hear all the time. I know I have because I've been advocating for McGregor to be playing there for two years. Is you know he's so good going forward. Well, how do you value that relative to what he just did Sunday? Because in my mind. Uh, the value of what he did Sunday was foundational, meaning that without him yeah. doing what he did, a lot of the rest of the good things that happened wouldn't have happened. So, so listen, I think there's a project here that you and I should probably uh, have, a, have a chat offline about, which is that sort of value model. Because when I break down a game in, on my own, it's my own sort of records, if you like, I think about it in um, in sort of in, se in sections of of competency. So the first one is all their own defensive actions. And, and every player gets rated it on their defense. I say rated all the, some key metrics that appear around, you know, what are the defensive actions. Then I look at the effectiveness of possessions. This isn't necessarily looking at what you did about the possession. It's more, you know, are you winning possession or are you giving possession away? It doesn't, it's not saying it's a good or a bad thing. It's just saying how effective were you at either keeping or losing possession. Then you look at creativity, and that brings in your key passes, your chances, your secondary assists, your crossing, your pack passing, your dribbling, um, and your progressive runs, and then your expected assists and all that good stuff. And then I look at goal threat, which is how many shots you're having, how many big chances, what's your off-the-ball movement, how many possessions in the box, what's your expected goals. And then your attacking threat is the amalgamation of some of the creativity and the goal threat. And then finally, I look at discipline. How many fouls did you give away? So there's a framework there for um, assess for building a value model where you sort of say you you, you get to you could get to a position where you say defensive action success rate is a percentage, and, and the value is this. Um, expected goals is a is, is, is also a percentage, I suppose, but it's slightly different. And it's like how do you say what? How do you say what? Which one is worth an equivalent amount? And now because you've got because I've got a benchmark of. Celtic players going back six years. I think there's a, the potential to, to right. do that actually, and actually start yeah, to, it, to, 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 to build something that you know what is what is what is above and below average look like. Yeah, and we, we'll we'll talk. We can talk about that later. I, there, there's two that are getting fairly common. One's expected threat. Um, another one is I think it's called G value or G plus, which um, the American Soccer Analytics site um, releases that for MLS. 
um, which actually I just tapped into that a couple of weeks ago when I looked at um, the keeper, you know, trying to trying to back into what's the value of the sweeper keeper role, you know, out, out 35 yards, ball playing and passing and, and the defensive as aspect of being a sweeper. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we can talk about that offline. And I, and I think it's a it's a it's a question that is, um, I think, paramount because uh, I think that from a culture perspective, um, particularly with Celtic in the last, you know, 13, 14 years because of the, uh, the, the dominance of Brown as, as the captain and really the, the leader of the club um, in, in, you know, multiple dimensions, um, you know, culturally there, there might be some bias towards replacing him. And it seems, I, I might, I'm guessing that's probably part of what happened with bringing in McCarthy uh, because McCarthy's profile doesn't fit with with an, a traditional Ange uh, midfielder or a center mid or a defensive mid, or at least what he's done in Japan. Um, you know, things were a little different at the national team at, at uh, Australia, but again, that's going back, you know, four years now. And, and the national team environment's just, you know, just different inherently than, than the club environment. Um, so I think that's going to be an ongoing question as far as, you know, that – defense first tackling defensive midfielder, how much value there is in that role, the recycling of possession, the interceptions, uh, you know, kind of the traditional shielding of the back, you know, the center back, so to speak, in, in Celtics um, in system relative to what we saw Sunday, which again, you have to caveat it. <laughs> Dundee were terrible. Um, and and there, there's, you know, I always say there's that, does it scale, you know, what, what you can do against Dundee does that scale against, let's say, a team of Hibs level or Rangers, or then maybe theoretically at some point, you know, we'll see against Alkmaar, um, who's probably closer to Rangers. Hopefully, we get to see them in, a, in uh, starting next week, um, because it, it's one one of the things I posted on this week was um, on Twitter was you know I just did a, a study. I went back and looked at all of the games, and um, you know, when we've had McGregor in that spot, it's not only um, the attacking side of the ball, it's defensively where he, and it's not because he's a great tackler, for sure, we know that. Um, it's all of the other things that he's doing in order to break up play preemptively, maybe not on the ball, but spatially. And he's a, he has such spatial intelligence. Uh, and we see that when how he helps the team break the press. Uh, and we saw, I mean, Dundee sort of flirted with pressing early and then, as soon as McGregor started working his magic and we started slicing them open like a dead fish quickly, they just stopped. I mean, it was insane. They were going to, we, we could have scored 15 goals if they would have kept persisting with that. Um, so I, I think that's something we're going to have to monitor um, as, as we go forward and we'll probably keep talking about it. But I, the, as we segue here about this question about style of play, and it, the, I'm going to just be put, put my cards on the table. This is something I'm concerned about where right? we've been glowing and positive up, up until now. Um, it was coming. It was, we knew it was coming. Yeah, it was, it was coming. And, and I, I, I'm still really concerned about how the pieces fit together here. Um, so let me just lay out my 30 second case or 60 second case. I'd love to hear your initial response is, you know, cause I, what I've learned in, in um, dialoguing with you over the last uh, 18 months is you know, 10 to 15 yards can be a huge deal. Um, you know, when you're setting up your lines and, and space between lines. Um, and when we talk about, you know, those pack passes that, that we, we're always mentioning is that when you have your lines, uh, greater distance between your lines, it's much easier for teams to capitalize on and then they pack pass you. And, and we had, you know, it was a huge problem for us last season because of the disorganization in our midfield, for example. So one of the concerns I've, I'm having, and we haven't seen it manifest yet, you know, again, one, one of the things I've done for 25 years now is try to get good at uh, second and third and fourth order thinking, you know, like a chess player does. And um, when I see Hart and where he's been playing, and again, it's not good or bad, it's just he's been playing so far like Joe Hart does. He hasn't been playing like an Ange keeper, at least that's been my assessment. Uh, he's been playing on the ball more, but it's been within the box for the most part, or right around the box. He hasn't been out 35 yards very much. Yeah. Um, and then you have Starfelt, let's say, which you, I think, you know, you wrote a good piece on Celtic by Numbers today, uh, which reviewed his stats so far. And I, you know, 
it certainly confirmed with what I had looked at with his pedigree up until Celtic signing him, which is very safe on the ball, but he's not going to be pinging 30 yard passes, taking out three defensive lines. Um, and he's not terribly pacey. So, you know, he's good positionally, really good in the tackle. Uh, who's the other center back going to be? And then we're looking at probably McCarthy as a defensive midfielder. So when I think about that and I start building a, a, a pyramid of lines in my mind, I don't understand how they're going to connect here from a heart staying at, let's say, maybe 20 yards out most of the time instead of that extra 10 or 15 yards forward that a Bain or a Barkas had been. And again, I'm not advocating that those two guys should have been the keepers. I'm saying that role-wise, how is the system going to work here? Uh, you've got the two center backs wide, relatively speaking. You've got the inverted fullbacks, and then you got a McCarthy sitting in front of those two. To me, that's awful stretched relative to what my understanding of so-called Ange ball is. And if we're not ha if we're going to have stretch there without a sweeper keeper, um, or in my mind, maybe worse, Hart trying to be a sweeper keeper when he doesn't have the athleticism probably to do it, uh, at, particularly at this age, being 34. McCarthy, everything I've looked at and I've listened, uh, you know, again, I always like to try and credit people. I, I listen to the cynic. I'm a subscriber to most of the fan media. So I was a, an initial subscriber to the cynic, Patreon, also the 20 Minute Tim. So I get a lot of, you know, research from other people. Uh, and, and Christian Wolf. Um, and, and his team at the Cynic did a really good review podcast and, and report on McCarthy. And I'm just having a hard time. And it confirmed what I've looked at and, and expanded on it much better than I, I had done with my review. I'm not getting how these pieces fit together relative to Ange Ball. Mm -hmm. And how, how do we, what are the vulnerabilities going to be from the lines and being stretched and not having someone who's a, a speed defensive midfielder? You know, McCarthy, if he's close, if he gets close enough, he's going to win the tackle nine times out of 10 or eight times out of 10, particularly at an SPFL level, probably. But I get concerned that we're, to a degree, going to be reliving some of the um, mistakes of last season, which is mm -hmm. the wrong pieces in the puzzle because of recruitment issues. Um, and, you know, as we talked about repeatedly, all, all of last season was not Neil Lennon's fault. Uh, you know, he got stuck with some players that didn't fit what he was trying to do either. And I've been one of the most critical people of Neil Lennon probably out there. Um, but, you know, he got stuck with pieces that didn't make sense. And I don't think he optimized. But optimization really isn't Ange's thing either. A Ange is into playing Ange, Ange, is, Ange ball. I mean, that's uh, – so what, what do you think – what do you think about all these issues kind of collectively from what we're kind of imposing on Ange now – yeah. And how does that fit with how he's going to play? Sure. So, you know, as always, you know, you're you're very uh, skilled in identifying the risks, right? And that, and that's that's the first um, that's the first step forward <laughs> in dealing with any any potential problems. Is My wife would call me paranoid, but go ahead. <laughs> no, no. It's <laughs> if you've ever worked in a risk function, it's it's what you do, right? It's uh, it's just thinking about the things that are are going to going to hurt you, cause you problems, and then you've got a fighting chance of doing something about it by planning around it. So, I, I completely hear you. I, I and I don't disagree. I think it is to be seen. So I'm just going to try and I suppose. Provide some, perhaps, just alternative thoughts to what you've what you've uh, you've put forward, which is equally uh, going to be, um, you know, uh, a view a bit subjective. And you know, I'm not saying this is the answer, but it's something else, some more to chew on, I suppose. So, I think if if you if you look at where we're going with some of the recruitment, um, whilst there's continued to be projects that we're, we're buying, and Abad is a bit of a surprise to me, I'll be honest. Um, you know, for for Hashi's what twenty six, yep. and McCarthy's thirty, Hart's thirty four, um, Starfield's twenty six. If we bring in this Juranovic, he's twenty five. They're looking at that Henri of O H uh, and he's twenty six. These are not old guys, but these are you know experienced professionals. So, and if you think of that core piece of the of the central defence, the goalkeeper and the central midfielder. You know, you know, with when Julian's back and he's 28, you're going to have a pretty seasoned, uh, experienced core there where, um, you know, positional intelligence 
is going to be there. You know, um, Ju Ju Julianne is, is 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 very slow, and if you catch, if you do on the rare occasion that you catch him one to one out in the paddock, yeah, he can look a bit, it can be, he can look a bit embarrassed. He generally doesn't get himself in those situations. Good defenders don't. Starfelt seems a pretty well organized defender to me. So right. I'm not saying oh it'll all be all right. I'm saying you know, and McCarthy whilst isn't is not a sprinter, he's a he's a like an everywhere all at once type player. Now it remains to be seen if he can get back to the player that he was when he was 22 at Everton. He's 30, but then the last two years he hasn't missed through injuries, missed through because he's not been he's not been selected. He was at a Crystal Palace team that had eight other defensive midfielders in the squad because it's a Roy yeah. Hodgson team, you know. So the, the, um, the guy so, that kept popping up when I was looking at with MacArthur. Oh, MacArthur. Uh, yeah, he's thirty. I mean, he looks like he, he looks like a, a <laughs> maniac. I, I yeah, I, 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 watch I, Crystal I didn't Palace, want but... to say that. I didn't want to say that because I, I kind of agree with you. And I, I made this sort of same conclusion, but he's uh, thirty three. He's a well known fan of the other other lot, by the way. So that's uh, why okay. that's why it's going to. I, I agree with you. I think he looked really good. Um, so yeah. So what I guess I guess what I'm saying is there's some mitigations there to that risk. I keep coming back to, and I know it's maybe this is going to be quite easy to pick holes in because of the extremity of the example I'm going to give. But I, I kept from 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 the very start of the European Championships, I, I, I kept sort of pointing out that watch Italy, and I'm not being smart after the fact. This is, I did this after the first game. I said watch Italy, not because you know they're, they're, I mean they are good and they're going to be fun to watch. But if you want to see a proxy for how Postecoglou is going to play, watch right. Italy, and just for that reason, no other reason, just. If you want to start understanding how he is going to arrange the pieces and yep. some of the styles and jobs that different parts of that team are going to be asked to do, watch Italy. Now, Italy had two 36, 37 year olds in central defence that have never been quick. The goalkeeper is six foot eight, and I'm sure he's probably quite rapid across the ground because of his, his, his stride pattern. But again, and then, you know, Verratti in central midfield is, is a little terrier. He's probably quite similar to McCarthy in that sense, but not rapid per se. So, I guess it's a very extreme example. They're clearly an incredibly well-drilled, well-managed um, team, and they were obviously very successful. And they're all, you know, there's some great players there. But the point I'm making is that you can play this way, i.e., a high line, a lot, of a lot of demanding uh, uh, on the passing, uh, with with the right players who are positionally disciplined. And yes, they may get exposed on occasions, but um, generally speaking, you know, their their positional skills. Will will allow them not not to get in those situations. So I guess I would counter with with that sort of argument that it's not just because we don't have that pace potentially in that core area, that that spine, that initial defensive spine, in all other respects, is is, is going to be a pretty um, gnarly spine. You know what I mean? To right. get through, yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's I. Um, th this is where. You know, I, I don't even think um, I, I don't have any preference relative to Soro or McCarthy. I mean, I, I think, you know, again, if McCarthy came in, they signed him on a four year deal, which is probably the craziest part of all of this. Yeah. Um, the fact that he was able to extract a four year deal, but um, hopefully his agents getting properly compensated for that um, is, uh, you know, back to this question of role and uh I always, always throw out my cross sport metaphors. I'm going to use American football on this one. So just conceptually to me with your, if you're going to play a single pivot and again, I, I think I, I'd be surprised. This goes a related question about Turnbull eight or 10. I mean, so far, I mean, in Andrew's system to me, probably it looks like he's going to have more value as an eight because it's part of what, I think you you expressed the, a similar um, question that he seems to be proving a little bit is that he's functional at least in in the press in the pressing system. Uh, so that was kind of my big question was wh whether he was going to be able to do that. And and mm. so far he's looking like you know we'll have to see him do yeah. it against better opposition. Yeah. But yeah. there's some promise there. Um, so if you if you're looking at you know kind of a six with two eights, which seem you know it's for the most part what Ange is you know um, tilted towards. Uh, at, at Marinos in Japan, and I think so far at, at Celtic even, what's that single pivot? What's more yeah. important? Is, is, it, is it that defensive stoutness? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or is it, um, you know, my cross sport, my, you know, do, do you want to play Drew Brees, who's one of the all-time great kind of 
uh, quarterback technicians that's ever played, right? So he didn't. He, he's not a guy that has the biggest arm. He's short. Actually, when they draft, he got drafted. Um, a lot of teams passed on him because they thought he was too short. I think he's like five ten. Um, you know, and again, mo most NFL quarterbacks are six three, six four. You know, kind of like keeper size. Um, and but he's just really smart guy, really high American football IQ. Um, and was like a football scientist. He orchestrated the game as a quarterback, which is a huge value. Uh, most of the great quarterbacks are able to do that. And, and in my mind, it's like, do you, would you play him at, at slot receiver? It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, because he's got that brain, you know? And that, I, I think the, the, the part of Cal McGregor's game that is undervalued is how smart he is. Yeah. What, it, what his football IQ is, and in my mind, the value of empowering somebody like that centrally to be able to dictate and orchestrate from that central location above and beyond his athleticism, which is really good, his quickness and his, you know, he's got actually pretty pacey still. You know, I say still, he's what, 27. Um, but, yeah. you know, he, he's not he's not lightning fast, but he's fast enough. Hmm. And um, to have that spatial intelligence, to have the football IQ, had the ability to to relieve pressure and that, that's my fear is that if you're going to have the you know if you're going to have heart as the keeper which looks like that's locked on now um you know and this is why i've started to get into discussions with people where i see a scenario here where near near baton is the preferred center back because of the mix of ball progression Right. That having to be a priority in the, you know, in the system dynamics that I always talk about, mm -hmm. which is if it's it's not going to come from heart, it's, we don't think it's going to come from Starfelt. That's not McCarthy's game. It's not. I mean, I, he might be able to improve or get better at it, but he is not a no. deep lying creative yeah. force or so, ball so, progressor. So, so who's going to serve that yeah. role? Yeah. And that, that's where I get back to this issue. If you're going to play a single pivot, it's not going to be McCarthy. It's not going to be Starfelt. It's not going to be Hart. It's probably not going to be Julian, although he's better. So does that sentence us to a reality of near baton at center back? And and if not, then are we then having to drop McGregor or Turnbull? So you see what I'm saying here? We're getting towards yeah. all, so, all so, of a sudden so. we're dropping players to help. And that stymies the attack when just put McGregor there and let him run the show. That's yeah. kind of my... Yeah, yeah. So, 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 let me try and reframe that, uh, just because I, I think it's a really good point. So, when we talked about if you know the scenario in in where we end up with a effectively a defensive spine of Hart, Julian, Starfelt, and then McCarthy. So, my point was that's probably going to be irrespective of the high line and irrespective of the, the 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 demands on on position field position. I I suspect that will be a pretty good defensive spine in, in that in, in from a defensive perspective but I agree with you from a ball progression perspective there's a lot of risk in there now a lot of risk I can only caveat that a little bit Julian's actually got a decent range of passing does yeah yeah you know Starfell is is incredibly efficient in his passing and he can right. break the first line so he can get the ball to the midfielder and he to does McGregor. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm with you. Right. I'm with you. I'm with you. Right. 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 McCar right. McCarthy, McCarthy is going to be fascinating because I, after all this time, I, I literally don't know what we're going to get. So that's right. going to be really interesting. So I'm, I'm going to hold, hold judgment on that one. But what are we, again? Let me, let me. I'm not answering your question here, but I'm just for people kind of listening, just trying to reframe it in a, in a, in a slightly different way because I think just trying to sort of bring to life some of the, some of the um, considerations here from a, a performance perspective. Is that, and it comes back to your original question: is how do you put a value on different aspects of a performance, and what matters most? Now, clearly, against Dundee, having somebody running around the pitch winning tackles is probably got limited utility. So it's contextual as well. It's not just it's not an absolute. But but let, let's pick on McGregor. So McGregor, you know, actually led the team in winning five possessions back. <laughs> no one else won more, um, and he and he won five challenges. Uh, but his his defensive action success rate. It's probably going to be around 50%, 
whereas yeah. Browns is around just over sixty, between sixty and sixty-five. Right. Okay. So let's 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 let's, let's just. I would expect a, McCarthy to be yeah. close to closer to Brown or higher than yeah, Brown. Yeah. And, yeah. And let's just let's just let's just let's hold that thought for a second. So. Yeah. So you you're saying we're taking ten to fifteen percent away from our defensive action success rate, our ability to to win the ball back, intercept it, to win challenges. Is that more important than somebody who is then probably passing the ball 30, 40 times more and is breaking the lines with those passes probably double what the more defensive player will do? So you're looking at a magnitude of um, 30 additional passes of the ball in, in, in essence. And, and, and the number, the volume of passes is important in the sense that it can be a proxy for the speed of play. You know, if you're if you're if you, if you create if you pass the ball ninety times in a game versus one hundred and eight, it may be it may be it may be because you're you're capable of moving the ball a bit quicker. So it's an inference. Well, I, it's not it's not it's not a linear relationship, but it's it's something you can infer. So so with and with with McGregor, you're probably going to get rather than six or seven pack passes, break, line breaking passes, you're probably going to get twelve or thirteen. You're probably going to get maybe rather than no shots or just under one shot at goal on average, you're probably going to get one or two, and you're probably going to get maybe zero chances created. You might get again one or two. You add all that up, and and on the and and, and on the creative side, is that worth more than that ten to fifteen percent of of defensive solidity? Is the question. Yep. I don't know the answer because it's probably contextual, yep. uh, uh, but it's a really important question. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's different depending on the level of the opposition yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and tactically. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. so the one thing I wanted to mention. So one, one of the things that I think McGregor has that is not normal, meaning that it's it's a it's a skill that's uh, it's it's that quickness of intelligence. Yeah. So, so it's not only that he's smart, it's that he's able to do it quickly. Yes. And, you know, so there's a lot of people that are smart that are deliberate. Yes. Um, you know, yeah. but Tur for him Turnbull, to, actually, yeah, Turnbull would be one of those. I think you're probably right. And, and it, you know, you can improve on that, obviously, through training and, and um, you know, actually cognitive training. It's um, one, one thing that, you know, it's kind of the, the, the pioneering side of of uh, advanced training and analytics. Um, but I, I see him already a fully functioning, you know, uh, Death Star, so to speak, cognitively, meaning that he, he relative to Ange ball, that one and two touch distribution that needs to take place from that central area, he is custom tailor-made for that already off the shelf. There's no training ground. There's no requirement to scale him up to get to that level. I mean, it's just plug and play for him. Yeah. Um, and, and that's to me. Yeah. If you, if you, if you, if you join that with Christie uh, on one side and Keogh on front and Turnbull, you've got a terrifying, central threat <laughs> in terms of just the, the speed that that ball is going to move forward. Um, and these are good technical players, which means the first touch is going to be good and the scanning is good. The, 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 the next action, you know, is, 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 is seen quickly and executed that, that to me, I'd love to see that tonight. I'd love to yep. see Christie move across and play where Rogic played on, on Sunday and see see how that and goes. put Forrest because, out left, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I, or, I, I, I think, yeah, yeah, or or even yeah, yeah. I would I, I would swap Forrest in a bad in all honesty, but hey, that's you know I can't, yeah. I can't argue you can't argue with what what you know Forrest was fantastic against Javlinek. Uh and uh, and Abada's just been he's been consistent in his games, right? And yeah, uh, you know I keep reminding everybody he's nineteen, right? He's, Wow. He's, coming, he's coming from Israel. It's pretty amazing, actually, in, in the way he's performed. And and and, and he's um and you, you're you're I'm guessing your data is probably in this neighborhood. But I mean, if he were to keep up the pro-rated rate at which he has output so far, I mean, he's basically messy. From a, <laughs> right from an purely from an XGXA perspective, I mean, his output has been, and that's a recipe for um, a huge recipe for cognitive bias, meaning that. His first impression for everybody right now has been that this guy is really good um, yeah. because yeah. his output has been incredible. Um, but to your point, I mean, he's a young player. Um, you know, he, he, he's going to have ups and downs. Um, my, my concern with him is more so levels, meaning that um, the sides that he's faced so far that are inferior, he's, you know, going berserk against physically. And then, you know, that second game against Michelin where they 
clearly had prepared for him better than they had in the first game um, and had somebody marking him or going up against him. They had a strategy, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So they, they, they had already game planned to deal with him. And his effectiveness basically went from a dominant looking player to almost like a ghost mm -hmm. because they had basically, you know, ushered him inside onto his left foot, took away going to the byline and having help inside. Um, so I, I call this again, uh, another analogy. If, if anyone wants to look up this a baseball player from many years ago called Kevin Moss, he was, a, he came onto the scene and for the New York, I hate the New York Yankees as I always yell at, uh, end up for wearing that terrible hat, but, uh, he came on with the Yankees and I think in his first month was like the best player in baseball. And then the guy disappeared forever. It was like a flash in the pan, you know, because the book, you know, they call it in baseball, the book comes out. Right? Do you pitch? Can the guy hit a high fastball? Can he not hit a slider? Like, where do you pitch him? And um, so, no one has the book on Abada to a large degree yet, and I think they're yeah. going to get the book on him. And, yeah. and so that's. No, I hope. Sure, I, I hope it sure. works out. No, like, for sure. Hope, yeah. That's every player, but yeah, I hope exactly. he works yeah. out. It's just like I. I worry because I had the same concern about Turnbull. We've seen some of that. You know, it turned nasty a little bit prior to this game Sunday. So, you know, people were starting to get a little nasty about Turnbull all of a sudden. Um, and I, I commented on this last season about, you know, people were kind of getting out ahead of their skis a little bit on how optimistic they were getting on Turnbull. And I always worry about that with a really young player because, yeah. you know, it can create levels of pressure and expectations that really are unfair. And this yeah. is, so that's what I'm getting at here. I'm not, I hope Abad is our best signing ever. Um, but he's been having output that's kind of messy-esque in, in his first few games, that is not going to last. No. Um, and, you know, there's a risk here, back to, you know, me always being paranoid of the risk, that the book's going to come out on him a little bit, particularly in the SPFL. And even kind of mid-tier teams are reasonably athletic in some of those positions. So he's going to have more of a difficult time going forward. And I just don't want people – switching yeah. on them and flipping on them and getting crazy negative because the expectations have been set at an insanely unreasonable level. Yeah. Uh, so listen, that's, that's all sensible, right? And I think Buster Coakley has been pretty consistent. He said, look, there's some players that are playing that, you know, they're playing every minute of every game and that isn't how he would want to do this. He's, he's right. throwing, he's throwing guys in. They've not even had a training session. You know, he doesn't want to do any of this, but that's, that's literally where we are. Um, so I, I don't think that's going to be the sustaining thing. So we do, we're nowhere near having two players in each position. I would see Forrest Nabada being that, and I think Nabada may, 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 you know, if he does have a dip, which he will do, he's 19, he's, you know, he's gonna, yeah. he's gonna have a little bit of a dip, and and Forrest comes back in on the right. That's great, and that, and then Nabada comes on as a sub, and maybe sometimes he comes in on the left, maybe sometimes he goes down the middle, maybe you know whatever. So I, I know that's the way I would see him being used. Um, but yeah, no, he's, he's had a great start. On, on limited ball, he's again, he's not, not one of these that gets involved all the time. Um, but to my goodness, when he does get the ball, his efficiency is is high. Um, yeah, and it, he, se he seems like he might have that intangible as a, uh, uh, you know, a bloodhound. He's got a nose for oh, the ball. You know, yeah, I mean, his two goals, his, his arrival, um, and it's all very yeah. well saying, well, he just wandered into the center of the box. Yeah, but it's the timing, right? right? And then it's yeah. the control of the of the shots that he's had. And all of that comes into it as well. And and I and I was, you know, you, you you know that movement off the ball. The, you know, you sort of think, well, okay, one you might get lucky once the ball falls to you, you put away, or you sort of see the same so the player make that move repeatedly, and it's you think, well, actually, you're timing this really well. You've got that spatial awareness, etc. That's that's really good. That's really high end because again, an ange ball, you need your wingers to be hitting the center of the box when the ball's on the other side. Uh, again, you, I keep using the example of I have to find another one. <laughs> you, know, the, the, you know, from 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 you know, Raheem Sterling, the number of goals that he scored. I mean, Raheem Sterling can barely kick a ball. His technique right. is appalling. His striking technique is awful. But but when you're scoring goals from within the six yard box, it doesn't need to be very good. You literally just and, need to get it on target. So keep and making and those. Darn, he's fast, <laughs> <laughs> and he's very fast. Yeah, yeah. Well. Um, Maybe wrap it up here with uh, talk a little bit about uh, the game um, tonight. Um, uh, what what I, I'm I mean reasonably optimistic, but I think again uh, I see a risk of Sunday <laughs> setting unreasonable expectations. In that you know they J Jablonek 
um, were at least functional in certain ways in attack that gave us some issues. Um, I think that their, I don't know what you had their XG app, but it was over one, I think, pretty consistently. It was over one. There. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, the, that's the kind of level where you have a rough game bad luck wise, meaning that you just don't have your shooting boots on for the day. And may, you know, maybe this is the game uh, we, we go, you know, one for 20 shots on target kind of nonsense. Um, you know, I think it's reasonable to expect that they're going to get some opportunities at goal given the state of our, our defense. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's a, you know, anywhere near a 60, 40 or a 50, 50 type of game, but I think there's enough risk in the game that I wouldn't, you know, uh, book my tickets to, to Alkmaar yet. Um, but I mean, it should be, should be a comfortable game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had their XG at 1.4 actually. And so yeah. it was 3.7. Right. So it's still a good, it would well worth the two goal victory in that sense. Uh, I know, I know one game XGs are, are not, Probably not shouldn't be used in that way. To, in all honesty, but uh, it's it's yeah. just an indicator. Right? It's just it's just a, another bit of data, right? Um, I think you know the, again context, right? Hart Hart making his debut. I mean, arguably, as I pointed out, their first goal um, was after Hart and Taylor were pr- shown up for how they can be very uncomfortable trying to play the ball out. Yeah. And, and it actually ended up in central midfield, um, and then you know, really bit on was I'm sorry, but it was you know he he, he was the main, the, <laughs> the main the main the main the main culprit for both goals. He does, and, and actually in both goals, he, 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 there's now a thing now that is identifiable where he, where he momentarily freezes, f- and he's straight on, so his body shape is 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 all over the place, and he yeah. doesn't, and he just has that split second where he doesn't react. And that's two, yeah. That split second, it's literally half a second. Yeah, they're gone. And, that, and yeah. that's it. And that's it. Right. When Ralston passes him on, um, he's actually still relatively a few yards in front of Bitton, but he, mm-hmm. but he simply doesn't react. And then the yeah. second goal is the same. If you, you Starfelt's actually, whilst Bitton is stood facing up the field, and the guy is about to launch the ball in behind him, Starfelt has already turned to track the runner. <laughs> That's well, that's that's the reaction times that right. we're talking about, but that makes an enormous difference. Yeah. Um, so he's so it hearts two games, two games in, and a few training sessions under his belt. He already had a slightly different, let's call it safer passing approach on Sunday than he did on Wednesday, Thursday. You know, he's a smart guy, he's an experienced player. Um, Welsh is probably going to be in beside Starfelt, and that that in its that in and of itself reduces risk hugely. I think. By at least at least uh, one XG, <laughs> I'm gonna say. Um, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm so I'm probably a little bit heartened by that. I, I would be interested to see what he does. Um, you know, would it be too much of a risk, for example, to actually give McGregor a rest and just say put Sorrow back in and just uh, you know? On the other hand, I'd love to see uh, this 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 Christie Turnbull McGregor uh, axis in the centre. I think that would be thrilling. Um, you do you do you give a bad a bit of a night off and just say, look, son, you've done really well. I don't want to let's not let's not push our luck here. Let's give you a bit of a breather. Do you do you wrap Kyogo in cotton wool and say to Edward, you know, you you've not been sold yet. This could be your last hurrah type of thing. I don't know. Right. I think there's some choices there. I, what I wouldn't probably do, and I don't think he will do, is 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 mess with that defensive shape. I think you've got to keep at it. It's had no stability. You probably want to introduce that stability as best you can. We don't yeah. have another. We don't literally don't have another right back, and Ralston's obviously you know he's he's absolutely maxing out uh, his contribution. You know, bless him, he, he really is. You can't fault him, fault the contribution that he's made. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, 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 yeah. So slightly less. I guess I suppose I'm slightly less nervous than you are for those reasons. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm not so much nervous. Mm. I think again, I think uh, you know, just anecdotally, I, I, mm. I get a lot of um, sense that people were. A lot of people are thinking that this is a you know maybe not a done deal, but oh, yeah, yeah. Th- that there there's almost zero risk in this game. And I'm not saying that it's uh, you know it should be a comfortable win, highly probable you know more of a a four one type of game or a five one than than losing by far. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm most uh, interested in that call between Welsh and Beton. I, I think that'll provide some serious insight. Into um, into what what Ange is thinking 
Um, and I think there's some second and third order conclusions that may be able to get drawn if, if it is beaten relative to what recruitment's been so far. Yes, um, and, and how and how he values, you know, uh, that ball playing relative to, you know, the safer pick. Because I agree with you. I mean, Welsh is, I think, clearly the safer yeah. Um, and Welsh's uh, ball, Welsh's ball progression, as I keep saying, last season improved as as the season went on, and was, I would say, you know, him and Starfelt yeah. would both do a, a good job of at least getting it to a Christie or a Turnbull, and that's well, really that's, that's really what you want. <laughs> I, I, the study I did, and we'll wrap up here. Um, the study I did at looking at the highest XG and the highest XG differential games, so I bundled them all up and uh, looked at you know the top. All of the ones that included three XG or higher, and out of I think it was 328 games, I know uh, Y Scout does, didn't cover some of the uh, I think League Cup games in 15, 16. So this, this isn't a, it's not a hundred percent of all minutes of all competitive games, but it's pretty close over uh, that period. So I think it was 328 games. 45 of them had XG of three or higher, um, and if you then look at those relative to differentials um mcgregor playing at the six was five out of the top 22 games even though he's played it there only like three percent of the minutes i mean it's really small sample size the interesting part because i didn't even expect this to happen was that beton as a six which was almost all front loaded in that sample to that 15 16 hmm. season um had as much of a sample representation in that top 45 and most of the time in that sample he was paired with brown right. um as you remember in that season they played next to each other quite a bit and, and, <laughs> I, and I think that so his his i think because i agree with welsh has definitely um improved in that area but i, I think beton and i'm not saying that this is he should be playing there or should be playing at the same. I'm not arguing any of that. I'm just saying from a player value perspective, kind of like what we've talked about within Cham in the past, where he put, certainly had his issues and, you know, God knows it was a mess uh, towards the end. Um, and it may end up that way with Beton as well. But I think that his value as a player, I think, is misunderstood relative to how he can do that. I mean, that, I, I don't think he's – you know, above average in that sense. I think he's probably well above average in those kind of line. And we saw that with the, you know, the flip side of that debacle defensively was that pass he made to unleash yeah. Kyogo. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, I'm with you. Yeah. So I, that, I just yeah. thought I'd share that because I did the work and it was it was surprising to me. I mean, I, I didn't expect to see it. And it, and it, but it also goes back to that this discussion. We'll kind of wrap it up here. Is um, Brown only had one as a central pivot in that sample. Um, one game in the top 22. So McGregor had five, and, and Brown was like well over six times the minutes in the role. Now, not that Brown didn't have any representation there, but it was as part of a dual pivot. So he was always paired with the majority of the time, Beton and Cham, a little bit of McGregor. But, you know, as we've seen, that McGregor Brown pairing <laughs> we've talked about. Um, so this, this is where I go back to McCarthy, who even we're going to play two down there, if we end up having to drop to a, a dual pivot, who's that second one going to be? And I'm I'm not sure we have that person. Yeah, um, but, I mean, just very quickly, so, I mean, this is, people are going to hate this, but I, you know, in terms of squad management, I wouldn't have signed McCarthy. I'd have said to Bitten, right, you're six, and, and, and then signed another centre-back. <laughs> that would have been, that's what I would have done. But possible. And, and, and yeah. I, I, my only yeah. concern with Bitton now is, 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 relative to that, is, is um, I, I don't know if he has the athleticism at this point with all the amount of injuries he's had um, to be able to play in that role. But, yeah, I, I – from a skills perspective, yeah, I mean, I, I think for for an Ange Ball perspective, he his one because he's got that quick thought, that intelligence to move the ball quickly uh, when he decides to do it. I mean, he can be a glacial guy at times too when he stands on the ball. But um, well, great. Well, I, I I think that's long enough of going over an hour here. Hopefully, uh, this hasn't been too horrible. Um, I, I, I will welcome Enda back with open arms next week so that he can do all of the hard work here as far as getting this done. So, uh, it's been a pleasure as always, Alan, and, uh, hopefully we get a, a, a good win today and, uh, we can get ready for, for Alkmaar next week and, 
and get into the Europa League because I'm not looking forward to the conference league. I don't know about you. So, <laughs> anything. <laughs> yeah, well, anything. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, all right. Well, have a good week, everyone, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you next week. Cheers. Thanks.